Well, if we want to be able to read the feedback, then yeah. Right. All right. Welcome to the replay. We are starting Sunny D58. Welcome. So if you want to come over here, you can actually see. Very excited. Named Marcus joined. Welcome. Today we're starting a new weekly series called Ask a Physicist Any. Whoa, okay. So my name is Joe. I'm the physics program chair at Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz, California. And I am here with... Hi there. My name is Paul. I'm one of the instructors here at uh, Cabrillo and uh, looking forward to talking to you today. So I wanted to do this as a weekly series because I love asking Paul questions and getting the answer. Hey there, Jason949. Paul is awesome at explaining things. So not really sure how this is going to work. Great idea. Thank you so much. We're going to try it out. So I'm hoping these are about 30 minutes long. The goal is to just talk about some really cool physics and see if you can stump Paul. So what I want to do is just open it up for questions. And if you have a question, Type it on in as a comment, and then we will uh, we'll start filming. Quantum entanglement, starting Quantum off. Quantum entanglement, ah, man, that is a tough one. Uh, what do you want to know about quantum entanglement? That's something we could teach a, a, uh, a course on, and I'm not <laughs> saying that I'd be ready to teach that course right now, but the, uh, but, but, but what? Uh... Uh, Jason, is there a specific question you have on quantum entanglement? I heard somewhere that speeding something up somewhere and it might create a black hole. Is that true? Now, is that the entanglement question or is that a new question? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> true. Uh, ask that question one more time. Is it true that if you speed something up, you create a black hole? New question. New question. Okay, yeah, if you, um, so I'll, I'll, I'm not sure if that's a new person or if it's the same person who asked the entanglement one. So I haven't forgotten that we've got entanglement on the agenda here also. Excellent. But the, um, well, black holes are creatures of general relativity, which was Einstein's next big project after he finished his uh, famous paper on special relativity in 1905. Um, General relativity is that model that you've probably heard of, you've probably seen animations of it, where you set a bowling ball on a trampoline and it bends the fabric. That obviously, you know, there, there, there's a lot of ways that you'd say, now nah, you could stretch that analogy too far, no pun intended, that, uh, that um, you know, if you set the bowling ball on the trampoline, then it's gravity itself that pulls it down. But in general relativity, no, gravity is the curvature of space-time. But the idea is that the space-time we live in, this four-dimensional space-time, three dimensions of space that we're all used to just kind of looking at and counting, one dimension of time, that this, is, this fabric isn't just a passive arena that, uh, that the universe plays out its games in, that space-time itself is a bendable, malleable, it's a player in the game. You can do things with it. You can stretch it. That stores energy in it. It wants to spring back like any good elastic membrane does. The thing that causes space-time to stretch, the thing that distorts it, well, a lot of times we say mass distorts space-time, and that's how gravity works. And while that's true, mass does distort space-time, but as Einstein's earlier version of relativity, special relativity had told us, mass is, is another form of energy. Um, you know, mass is just one of them. Oh. Get a comment, please speak a little slower. Ah. We'll try and do that. We get very excited when talking about physics and exciting stuff try and slow it down a bit and uh yeah thanks for the comment okay apologies for that um suppose i should stop and collect my thoughts what i was getting at is that it's not just mass that bends the fabric of space-time it's any form of energy these days the universe has kind of cooled down to the point that most of the energy available and i'm not getting right now into dark matter or dark energy because that's a uh, a, a a whole separate can of worms yes but at least if we stick to the regular old mundane matter most of the energy available in the universe right now is in the form of matter so when you see space-time get curved it's usually because you've got a lot of mass there if i wanted to make a black dark hole matter. um easiest way to make one is out of the remnants of a giant star and you'd say, yeah, it is all the mass in the core of that star collapsing into a point that pulls space-time into that. And you can see I'm kind of miming out that funnel shape that you always see drawn on the online animations for a black hole. But um, it doesn't have to be mass. Any form of energy could do that. In the earliest moments of the universe, actually most of the energy was in the form of 
photons, high velocity particles of light. Actually, even earlier than that, you had this quark lepton soup and you had all kinds of stuff going on. But for about the first 100,000 years of the universe, so from the you know, first fraction of a second onward, actually most of the energy in the universe was in the form of photons of light. And that energy was what gave space time its shape. So yeah, give, get something going fast enough, give it enough kinetic energy, and yeah, that, 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 hmm. <laughs> Could it increase its mass enough so that it would create a black hole? And all of a sudden, okay, you see us thinking real time here, all of a sudden I'm gonna change my mind and say, no, wait a minute, if it's just moving along in a straight line, then if you are riding along next to that particle, then it's not moving at all. So you would measure it to have zero kinetic energy. So all of a sudden, I am going to change my mind on what I was about to say and say, no, just the absolute velocity of a particle. I don't care how close you get it going to the speed of light. That energy in itself is actually not going to give you a black hole. And I was about to say exactly the opposite. So we're, uh, we're working without a net here. We're <laughs> answering your questions real time off the top of my head. Now, when you were saying, though, that you've heard that this could happen, if I put thermal energy in, so if I take, a, take a, a vial of coffee and I heat it up enough, that added thermal energy does make it act as if it had, ha had more mass. And you could say that's just getting all the molecules moving faster. But if I could somehow keep that bottle of coffee there and heat it up to 10 to the God knows how many degrees Kelvin, and I know you're not supposed to say degrees Kelvin, but I always do. <laughs> Heat it up to, to, to an obscene amount of Kelvins. Um, then, yeah, actually, then you would be increasing its effective mass and possibly being able to make a coffee-based black hole. Okay. Am I anywhere near the actual topic that you wanted us <laughs> to discuss here? It doesn't matter. Okay, so... <laughs> This is kind of off the cuff. This is our very first time doing it. Again, for those of you joining, my name is Joe. I'm the physics program chair at Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz, California. This Paul is Paul, Graham. one of our amazing instructors. And our goal is to just do a weekly half hour series answering questions. Now, we may not get to all the questions, but I will watch these replays and write down any questions that people have. So far, we had something on how entanglement works dark matter, what is dark matter, and interstellar, what we thought about the science of interstellar. I haven't seen the movie yet. Oh, I'll so, watch it before next week and I'll answer that for you. Okay. See, that's the good thing is we've got a, a, a wimp out mode here where we can say, you know what, I don't know, but I'll get back to you on that. You wanna talk dark matter? Let's talk dark matter. Okay, so real, uh, we'll get to quantum entanglement. Do you guys think Lisa Randall is a stud? Lisa Randall's awesome. Yes, she's awesome. Uh, I think entanglement is a more complicated topic that uh, certainly I would need to research further and able to, to, and able to talk about it. But want to do dark matter? Let's do dark matter. Okay, so Can real turn quick. This and get a whiteboard. Uh, yes, you do that, and I'll start. So real quickly, how do we know about dark matter? If I look at two planets orbiting each other, and I look at the orbit of one planet, I can figure out how mass the uh, how much mass the other planet has, or let me say, a planet orbiting a star. A star. We know gravity very well, and if I can figure out how planets are orbiting or look at a planet or a galaxy, I can calculate exactly how much mass there is. The cool thing is we know how much mass should be in different galaxies based upon their galactic or their gravitational pull on other galaxies. And when we go and we actually add up the mass of all the objects that are giving off light, so all of the stars and things like that, we only see about 10% of the mass that should be there, which means the other 90% of the mass that should be there from calculations that we know really well is not giving off any light. So we can't see it with a telescope. We know it has to be there, but it's not giving off light. And it looks like Paul, I'm gonna turn this around, wants to board stuff. All right, what do you got for us, Paul? All right, so this pinwheel is my admittedly amateurish drawing of a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. And there's a lot of other galaxies like ours out there. The, uh, the, the nearest and one of the most beautiful ones to, uh, to, to look at even through a low-powered telescope is the Andromeda Galaxy, which has again that wonderful spiral shape. It looks a lot prettier in real life than it does on my cartoonish uh, starfish illustration thing here. But if you look at one of these galaxies, um, what, you, what you notice is, I mean, a galaxy like ours or like Andromeda contains 
several hundred billion stars. So you could uh, claim like, uh, you know, probably close to, a, you could ask everybody on Earth to claim their favorite hundred stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and we'd probably have enough to go around. Now, as, as you look at the galaxy though, almost all of that luminous matter, almost all those glowing stars is there in the core. So what we figured at first is, hey, that must be where all the mass of the galaxy lives. It mostly lives in the core. And from there, it's easy enough to work out either using general relativity or even just uh, using Newton's old fashioned laws of gravity uh, that, that should work fine on this scale. It's easy enough to work out how quickly all these outlying stars must be orbiting that central core. And what they expected was that it was going to follow something they call Kepler's third law, the same as if you measured how quickly all the different planets in our solar system um, orbit around their central massive body, which is our sun. So the outer, you know, the outlying stars of the Milky Way or Andromeda orbiting the core should get slower as you go out. They should get slower as the square root of the distance for anybody who's uh, who's keeping score on that, but they should be orbiting more slowly as you move out toward the outside. Now for a while, um, just observing the structure of a distant galaxy itself was a big enough challenge. Uh, for a while, trying to make separate velocity measurements of the stars in different parts of that galaxy, which almost looks like a, a little speck on the sky in the first place at most resolutions, was beyond the technology of the telescopes they had. Until about 1970, when an astronomer from Caltech by the name of Vera Rubin um, was firing up a wonderful new high resolution instrument. And what she was gonna do with it was focus on other spiral galaxies and try to, rather than just measure how fast the whole galaxy is moving away from us or toward us, which is what Edwin Hubble was doing back earlier in the century, and that led us to the whole idea of the Big Bang expansion. But what Vera wanted to do was um, measure how fast different parts of it were moving. Let me she pause for one second. Oh. Just, uh, are there a bunch of people tuning in now? What we're doing is a weekly half hour series, Ask a Physicist Anything, and the question we're talking about right now is what is dark matter? Paul Graham is giving us an explanation of how we know dark matter is there, and then are you going to touch on what actually we're thinking dark matter is these days? Or I will do my best, yeah. All right, so here's that spiral galaxy orbiting around that way. I just kind of put it so it's orbiting counterclockwise. What Vera Rubin was doing was looking at galaxies where we're getting an edge-on view to them. So if this one is also orbiting counterclockwise as seen from above, then this side of it will be moving toward us. And this side of it will be spinning away from us, just because the whole thing is kind of spinning in a plane like this. And her instruments were sensitive enough that she could actually get separate blue shift readings, or red, blue or red shift readings, for the matter in different parts of this galaxy. Now, what she was expecting was if you measure how fast those stars are moving away from us or towards us, and this would be on top of the fact that the whole damn galaxy was moving away from us to begin with. But if you say, all right, but yeah, you know, ignore that, um, you know, correct for that, but see how fast you get this additional spinning motion. What she was expecting was the closer you are to the core, the faster those things would be moving. As you move farther away from the core, they'd be moving slower. So this is distance from core. That is not what she got at all. Over here on the other side, they'd be moving the other direction, but again, fastest as you go toward the core. She didn't see that. What she got was that they were all orbiting at roughly the same speed, regardless of how far from the core they were. And so what does that tell us? Paul. What it told most people was, damn, we thought these were good enough instruments to take this measurement, but I guess they're not yet. I guess we're still gonna have to improve the resolution. Dr. Rubin, though, was convinced that no, we, we got a good measurement. This is really what those stars are doing. Um, at the time, she was a lonely voice saying that, but as the instruments got better, sure enough, she was right. This was an accurate measurement of what those stars were doing. It was not a limitation of the instruments. Um, what that means is the stars out here, which ought to be orbiting very slowly because they're feeling a weaker pull from the gravity from the core, now to be able to orbit at that speed without just going flying out as, you know, as, as if they'd been thrown off a spinning merry-go-round or something like that, 
they, the force of gravity pulling them inward is a lot stronger than we expected. And what that seems to imply is that matter in this galaxy doesn't all live at the core. It's actually distributed out through the whole observable galaxy and beyond. So it looks like, so there's two possibilities. Either we're just absolutely wrong about the way gravity works at long distances, or we were wrong when we said all the matter of the galaxy you know, lived in the core where the luminous stars live. Now, as Joe said, you expand your view and you look at clusters of galaxies, and damn, if you look how those clusters are orbiting each other, again, they're going too fast. They ought to just fly off in a straight line at those speeds, unless there's more <laughs> matter yet distributed in among the galaxies in that cluster. So another source of dark matter. So I have a quick question I want to interject. So I've heard 90% of the matter in the universe is dark matter. I've heard about the same, yeah. And there's no reason to think that we live in a completely different part of the universe where things should be different. So doesn't that then mean that 90% of what makes up our body is dark matter? Ah, in which no. case I have a trouble <laughs> wrapping my brain around that. Next time my doctor tells me to lose some weight, and I'll, you know, 90% of it's dark matter, and I have no control over that. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. The, um, the dark matter does seem to be distributed through the whole galaxy. The luminous matter, though, has collapsed into small, dense regions like stars and solar systems. I mean, our solar system is made of what was once a gas cloud that extended several light years in every direction before it collapsed in the early stages. So uh, the dark matter seems not to collapse into small clumps like that. That's one of the, uh, the puzzles that we've gotten about it. So while it might be that 90% of the universe is made of dark matter, it might be that at least, you know, 50, 60, 70% of the Milky Way galaxy is made out of dark matter. That doesn't mean that our local environment is mostly dark matter. We've got this clump of ordinary matter called the Earth that we're standing on, which is in a region that's really rich in ordinary matter called the solar system. The dark matter, as far as we know, is still kind of spread out uniformly over a much greater length scale. So our, our immediate environment, no, not much of my body's made of dark matter, not much of our solar system's made of dark matter. But then if you extend out through that, you know, interstellar void between our solar system and the next one, there you're seeing dark matter where all the ordinary, you know, protons, neutrons, and electrons had collapsed into this, the, this clump that we call the solar system. Excellent. That, and we have about 10 minutes. Uh, hmm. Let me just turn this around. No, there's still a lot of this story to tell, but... Uh, oh, wait, I just... Also save some of this for next time. I turned know. it around so they can't see you. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, if they can hear me, there is still a lot of this they story. They can. Now. Okay. I look forward to these every Wednesday. So, yes, we're doing this every Wednesday, 3 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, kind of making this up as we go along, the exact format. I'm thinking, could you ask if dark matter... Is dark matter connected to quantum energy? We can touch on that in a second. Not quite sure the format. It's hard to actually have Paul talking and then answer questions. There's a lot of questions, but I will do is I'll watch the replay. I'll write down some questions that hopefully we'll touch on next Wednesday. Does Paul have thoughts on quantum entanglement? Yes, he definitely has thoughts on those. <laughs> so should we finish with dark matter and do quantum entanglement next week, or do you want to do that? Uh, we could... When they say quantum entanglement, are they thinking like EPR paradox kind of thing? Or uh... Yeah, can you, like quantum entanglement has lots of little facets that we could talk about. Is there something specific like quant or EPR paradox or something along those lines? If so, write it out in a question. I'll check back. Why don't we finish with dark matter? Okay. And then, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. And next Friday, actually not this coming Friday, I'm going to do a pretty cool thing called Is It Physics or Is It Magic? I'm starting to try out some amateur magician kind of stuff using magic in the classroom. And I've got some demos, some of which are going to be physics tricks, well, physics demos, some of which are going to be magic. Tomorrow I'm going to show you a pretty cool one. Actually, tomorrow's Thursday. Friday I'm going to show you one. At what school are you teaching? We are both instructors at Cabrillo College. It's a community college in Santa Cruz, California. I'm the program chair. Paul has been teaching here for 15 plus years. As you guys can probably see, he's passionate, he loves physics, and I love to listen to him explain stuff. So I'm going to turn this around, show you Paul again, finish up on dark matter, and then, uh, yeah, I hope to see you every Wednesday. Let's turn this around. Enlighten us all. Dark matter. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I never know which way that camera's pointing, and I promise it's we're pointing not going to forget you. about entangled. We will get there next time. <laughs> all right, so uh, to, to say a little more about dark matter, so, you know, 
you look at a galaxy, it's spinning way too fast. There's got to be more matter than we know pulling all those stars inward. You look at a cluster of galaxies, they're orbiting each other way too fast. There was another line of evidence, though, that also convinced people, and this was kind of the history of the universe. If you look at the very early universe, as you, as you trace the universe back, as you know, the, you know the, the modern Big Bang model, which again was kind of grew out of evidence that was first collected by Edwin Hubble and others in the uh, 1920s, 1930s, says that, yeah, the universe is expanding, gradually growing less dense as the matter moves far away. Well, you trace this expansion backwards in time, and you're going to see a, a more and more dense universe. And just like if you compress a, a container of gas just on your desktop, as you compress the universe back to a smaller and smaller space as you go backwards in time, the temperature is going to rise. The universe was hotter and denser when it first started. In fact, if you look at the first few seconds of the universe, it was pretty much, and we are fairly confident that we've got this part right. If I'm going to go back further than that, eventually we start getting to the point where it was so damn hot that the physics is really still unknown. We don't know how physics works at a sufficiently high energy. But if you go back just to the first few seconds of the universe, we're pretty confident we got it right when we say, yeah, the universe was this incredibly hot, uniform plasma. So the, there weren't clumps of matter, there weren't stars and galaxies, there was uh, just a, a plasma of super hot particles all mixed together uniformly everywhere. As it expanded, gradually over time as this gas cooled, gravity started pulling together clumps of it, which were, would form the ancestors of what today are stars and galaxies. The thing that freaked people out when they started trying to run more accurate computer models of how this would have worked was that it should have taken a lot longer. It should have taken like 20 billion years after the universe started before the first clumps of matter the size of like the Milky Way galaxy should have formed. Well, it didn't take 20 billion years. The universe, as we uh, now know, is only about 13 billion years old. So yeah, we wouldn't be there yet. Um, and looking back at the most distant and therefore oldest galaxies we can see, nah, galaxies formed within like the first billion years that the universe existed. So something happened to give them a head start. Those clumps of matter started forming sooner than they should have. Well, that actually became another big element in the search for dark matter. Because we realized that if dark matter, like we were saying with Joe, does not tend to clump up, um, the, the, the photons, the hot, the hot light that was mixed with this gas was what was keeping the ordinary matter, the protons, neutrons, and electrons, from clumping up too early. For the first 100,000 years of the universe, when it was still ionized, the matter was absorbing light. If you tried to form a clump of it, it would just absorb more light, heat up, and that clump would expand, so it would unform itself. Dark matter, though, since it doesn't absorb light, could have been quietly behind the scenes starting to form denser and denser clumps. Uh, not affecting really the normal matter yet, but then 100,000 years in, when the normal matter for finally cooled off to the point where the protons and neutrons captured one another and became neutral hydrogen, and the whole shebang became transparent to light so that it wouldn't absorb light and heat up if it tried to form a dense clump, well, there would be these pre-made clumps of dark matter that could be the seeds that the regular matter fell into. And, well, again, I, I, there, there, there's a whole story to tell about all the various successful and unsuccessful models of dark matter since then, but uniformly, these models had a better chance of replicating the way the universe really looks than a model with only protons, neutrons, and electrons ever would. Now, some of the things that they thought dark matter might be, Neutrinos were a, uh, were, were a early guess. The idea that neutrinos, which are these little ghost-like particles, they're close cousins of the electron, but they have no mass. Or maybe they do have mass. Oh, no, they don't. Oh, well, maybe they do. This, this debate has gone back and forth many times over the years. Neutrinos either have no mass or a very, very tiny mass. Well, some people were thinking, hey, if the answer is a very, very tiny mass, these neutrinos could be the dark matter. They do ignore light. A light or any electromagnetic thing cannot affect a neutrino. They only feel the weak nuclear force and gravity. And the weak nuclear force, by some freak of nomenclature, is really, really weak. So the um, <laughs> and gravity is even weaker than that, actually. So neutrinos like live this very isolated life where they barely interact with the rest of the universe at all. They're loners. But 
they were thinking, hey, a, a sufficient number of neutrinos, each with a little bit of mass, that might be what constitutes the dark matter, what explains the way galaxies behave today, and also might explain the way galaxies first formed, the way those clumps would have formed in the early universe. Well, they tried running the models, and damn, neutrinos didn't work right. They, formed, they, they implied the early clumps would be too big, that it, you'd get like this top-down structure formation. The ancestors of a supercluster of galaxies would form first, then clusters, then galaxies, then stars. That's not the way it actually works when you look at the history of the universe. So the, um, and, and even today, there'd be a lot more large-scale structure and a lot less small-scale structure. So they tried other things. They tried cold dark matter. Neutrinos were an example of hot dark matter. Hot meaning that even today, the neutrinos would be moving almost the speed of light. Um, Joel Premack at the University of, uh, of California at Santa Cruz, local to us, uh, had, had a great deal of success with a model of hot plus cold dark matter. Um, I used to work on a model that was uh, cosmic strings and cosmic textures where we were thinking, hey, maybe it's not matter at all. Maybe it was these uh, kind of folded up energy fields that had, had seeded that original structure. The, um, if you ask today what, uh, what, what dark matter actually is, <laughs> That's a million dollar damn. question. Damn, 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 I wish I knew. Um, the, the, the best candidate today would be, all right, it's something that, like neutrinos, does not feel the electromagnetic force. That's the only way it could have done the function that it did in the early universe, of ignoring could, light. Could dark matter be other universes? Could it be other universes? <laughs> not by any physics that we understand right now, no. So, uh, you know, again, there is physics we do not understand. We know for a fact that at a high enough energy, general relativity and quantum field theory, which are the best two models we've got, they flat out contradict each other. Now, this does not make physicists say, woe is me, my field is doomed. This makes us say, oh man, I hope I'm alive when we get to like sort out this mess and figure out what the real physics is that lies behind these approximations. I mean, if you ask people what would be the best time ever to have been a physicist, a lot of people would tell you, oh yeah, you know, the early part of the 20th century, 19 teens, 1920s, when people realized that quantum mechanics was a thing and had no goddamn idea yet how it worked. And uh, that, that's not a, you know, to a, phys to a scientist, that's not a bad situation. That is, that, that, that is paradise. You get to uh, tear down this tapestry that you thought was the laws of the universe and see this much broader framework behind it of which your tapestry was only a little corner and you get to figure out how the whole thing works. So yes, there, there, may, there may be physics we don't uh, yet understand. I might end up saying uh, 50 years from now, oh yeah, I remember when we, back when we did not know that uh, there was leakage of energy from other universes? I don't know. But, the, um, <laughs> but, but, but for now, from any physics that we actually have managed to verify and test and all that, nah, uh, we, 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 what we think dark matter probably is, is um, possibly what they call a supersymmetric particle. Some kind of particle which is a cousin of an existing particle, much heavier, ignores the electromagnetic force possibly, so only, um, only feels, again, the weak force and gravity. The um, one, one uh, acronym for these, which has been going on uh, since way back in the day, is WIMPs, Weakly Interactive Massive Particles. And machos. And, uh, yes, well, machos were a whole different candidate for dark matter. <laughs> these, were, these are what I usually call Jupiters with a small j. People thought at first, hey, maybe dark matter is just ordinary matter, protons, neutrons, and electrons. But when it fell into clumps, the clumps never got big enough to ignite nuclear fusion. In other words, they were just balls about the size of Jupiter. And if you had enough of those around, maybe that could be what's explaining how the galaxies spin. Now, that model is no longer considered viable for a couple of reasons. First, it does nothing to explain the early universe. It might explain the way objects are behaving today, but it does nothing to explain how that structure formed in the first place. Secondly, and you can say, well, maybe there's just you know, two different models, one to, to talk about what's going on today and a completely different reason why the structure formed in the first place. However, if there were all these little Jupiter-sized balls of matter hanging around, or even if it were just still neutral hydrogen gas hanging around that had never formed even into Jupiter-sized clumps, you'd be able to see that with modern astronomical instruments. If it was Jupiter-sized clumps, you'd see a lot more gravitational lensing, which means times when a star that you can see, because it's luminous, happens to have one of those Jupiter-sized balls lying right in the line of sight with it. And you can calculate how often that would occur if there were enough of these Jupiters 
to explain the rotation curves of galaxies, to explain how galaxies can rotate so fast without flying apart. And when that happens, the gra gravity bends light. So the light coming around one side of that Jupiter-sized thing would bend a little bit this way. Light coming around the other side would bend a little bit the other way. So if this is that luminous star you're looking at, this is that dark Jupiter that is happening to be there. This is your eyeball, or better yet, your telescope back here. The light coming from that star could bend this way around that object. Light on the other side of it could bend the other way around that same object. And since the only way you know where something is, is looking at the direction that the light entered your eyeball or your telescope, you would see two copies of that star. One that seemed to be tracing back along that direction, and another one that seemed to be tracing back along that direction. Now, now you can actually find pictures of these online, because yeah. you do actually have really good pictures of gravitational lensing. Yeah, I was going to say, gravitational lensing really is a thing. It's not that this doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen as often as it would if all of that dark matter that must be out there was just made of these Jupiter-sized balls. Now, if you say, hey, maybe it's not even Jupiter-sized spheres, maybe it's just gas. In that case, you could, or, or dust possibly, you could figure out the, um, how much light would be absorbed as it passes through that gas or dust. And again, you're not seeing the right absorption curves. Um, combine that with the fact that, hey, we would really like our dark matter model to do two duties. We would like it to uh, explain today's rotation curves of, of objects we look at, but we'd also like it to cast some insight onto uh, how, how structure formed in the universe in the first place. For both of those reasons, we pretty much are confident that no, dark matter is not anything made out of ordinary protons, neutrons, and electrons. It is some kind of more exotic particles than that. As they you know, hunt down new particles at places like the LHC at CERN in Switzerland, uh, you know, one hope that we always have is maybe we'll stumble on the first of those supersymmetric particles and maybe we'll actually have our dark matter candidate identified right there in the LHC. Hasn't <laughs> happened yet, but it is always kind of on the wish list for every new higher energy accelerator that comes online. How about we take and probably start to wrap it up. So if you can't tell, Paul loves physics. He's super passionate about it. And actually the reason I wanted to start this weekly series is just so I can listen and learn from Paul every single week. He helped me out tremendously when I first started teaching here. He's an encyclopedia of knowledge. So again, we're gonna be doing this. Thank you, Paul. They had lots of positive things to say about you. That was great. Very informative. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm glad you guys had fun. And uh, I, 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 I will sharpen my own thoughts on, uh, on quantum entanglement before next time. It probably would have just been a lot of hemming and hawing and, well, let's see. How should I put this? So I'll, I'll, I'll try to be on top of my game for that next time, and I will look forward to your questions. Yes, and again, we didn't touch on, somebody wanted to know about Interstellar, what we thought oh, about the physics of it. Yeah, we'll I haven't have seen the movie that. yet, but I'll watch it. And then how entanglement works, and I'll kind of go through and check out the comments and see if there were any other ones that people asked over and over that we didn't get a chance to answer. Okay. For those of you joining, thank you so much. My name is Joe. This is Paul. We're going to be here every Wednesday, 3 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And for those of you who don't know me, I made a one-year commitment to get on Periscope every single day and share daily doses of dopamine through education, entertainment, and inspiration. Today was about education. Yeah, Interstellar. Neil Tyson had a great bit on Fox regarding it. Cool. Yeah, Neil Tyson has great bits on everything. He, yeah. He is awesome. He's awesome. He's, uh, I love the new Cosmo. When it came out on Netflix, I watched it all in like I think two sittings. Okay, so anyway, knows, yeah, I, I think I've seen more of Neil Tyson's like talking about uh, Interstellar than I have of Interstellar itself. Yeah, but I, I will remedy that. <laughs> Now, <laughs> as physicists, I've actually learned to just turn off my physics brain whenever I'm going to an action movie or sci-fi. I used to drive my wife crazy. I'd be like, oh, come on, that can't happen. They're totally ignoring conservation of momentum. After doing that a couple times, now I just kind of turn off the physics brain and just enjoy the amazing spectacle of whatever I'm watching. Okay, so Wednesday, Three o'clock Pacific Standard Time will be back. And then tomorrow I'm going to be talking about 21 day no complaint experiment. It's an awesome experiment I'm doing. And then Friday, is it physics or is it magic? I got a cool thing to show you. 
Okay, Paul, you want to say goodbye? All right. See you guys next week. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed this and you know other people that would be interested, please share. Have a wonderful, uh, have a wonderful Wednesday. Or if you're catching this on the replay, wonderful Thursday. Till next time. Bye. Thank you, Named Marcus, for joining. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully, we'll see you next Wednesday. All right. Take care.